Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, or 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an, an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. Today, we have Leela Turner with us. Leela is going to be talking about dating and the impact of understanding the principles in this area. Leela is a co-partner and program director of One Thought, founder and CEO of Relationship Ready. Since 2013, Leela's sole focus has been sharing a principle-based understanding of the mind to individuals and organizations, addressing the leaky button issues people face in business as well as relationships. Leela is the founder of Relationship Ready, a sister company with the sole purpose of addressing invisible hurdles that frustrated singles face. Leela works alongside Aaron Turner, running One Thought, designing, developing, and providing programs to individuals and organizations. She also co-runs the One Thought Foundation program, developing new practitioners. Her clients vary widely from leaders, engineers, filmmakers, teachers, entrepreneurs, and teenagers. And Leela is a regular conference speaker and presenter both in the UK and abroad. Um, and you can reach Leela at several different websites, which I will post under the recording. They are onethought.com and relationship-ready.co.uk. But um, again, no worries. I will post those underneath the, the recording. So if you want to get in touch with Leela afterwards, you have a way of doing that. Leela, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share. This, this should be a fun webinar. Oh, thank you for the intro. It's like, this is your life. Hearing all of that makes me sound like a grown-up. <laughs> That's super cute. And um, thank you so much for having me. It's so funny. I feel like I want to do a whole intro to the 3PGC as well. Just having been around when it was founded, um, I'm just going to give my piece on it. The 3PGC is an absolute act of love. People don't think about that, but it's everybody volunteers their time and it's so lovely to contribute uh, towards that. It's a resource just to kind of, so that anybody can show up and find some resource for free. There's nothing getting in the way. And um, I'm really thrilled and honored to be one of your speakers. So thank you for having me. Oh, exciting. Hello everybody, hi. Um, so I was thinking, um, about what I wanted to share about this program. So I mostly wanted to talk about dating and relationships, and I wanted to tell the story of Relationship Ready, which goes back uh, ooh, 25 years, actually, but has been running as a program for three, but really the essence of relationships. It's not really about my program. It's about what I've seen, learned, and the impacts of people learning about what has been invisible to them until they start to see things that are visible that get easier in terms of dating and relationships. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, a part of the call is talk about people in relationships. Cause when I talk to people and they say, well, what do you do? And I'll say something vague and small. And then they say, but no, tell me really what, what do you do? And I, if I mention relationship ready, 50% of the people that I speak to say, Oh, I've got a friend who could do that. She's, she's gorgeous or he's gorgeous. They're so, fabulous I don't get it they could really do with that and they just keep getting frustrated and I they, they should totally come on that program so you know just talking to people in any bar or cocktail or any dinner party you people say oh my god I know someone who's so wonderful and I wished they could not have things in the way for them because I don't get it but the other 50 percent say oh god I've got a friend who could do with that and they mean people who are in relationships that are ambiguous or struggling to be in them and be happy and nourished within those so i am actually going to touch on that a little bit today just because i'm like well 50 percent is quite a lot do you know what i mean for people to say i i know people like i've had someone on one of the most recent programs that said i'm more lonely in relationships than i am when i'm out and i don't know how many people can relate to that because of how much thinking we do in them. Like, what are we supposed to be? What kind of person are we? What do we offer? Do I, you know, so there's, there, those are the two things that I wanted to cover um, in the webinar. But I, I wanted to tell the story just because it's, I think, a really lovely story. Um, 
And it starts with an, a very small insight and observation of a married couple. No, actually, I'm going to go way, way back. My first thought or kind of how this program or my, the way I work came alive was when I was in college. So I was doing my MA in St. Martin's in London in the 90s at some point. Um, and I noticed that a couple of people on the program, it was mostly women in fashion, there were men too, but the, the women that I hung out with, most of them were single, a couple of them had boyfriends, but it was usually that they'd got together with them on their first degree, but most people were single. They're in London, they're having a good time, they're in a really good university, so everybody's really kind of loving, kind of have sort of, they've kind of got to a point where they've really focused their passion and love for their work. And they're at the point where no one's got any really responsibilities. So you're 20 something, you've got no responsibilities, but you're honing your skills as a designer or whatever your passion skill set is. And I remember at the time, I happened to be in a relationship and that actually was with Aaron. And, but I noticed that a lot of my friends were very attractive and very vivacious and very free-minded in the way that they designed. And they were very passionate about um, designing or their skills, whether it was a leather worker or someone who's incredible with patterns or whatever it was. Like they were very passionate about that. But there was, a, by the time the course was ending, I noticed that most people were single and that was the only thing they generally moaned about more than not having enough money and because a lot of them hadn't started working properly yet. It was relationships that people complained about. And I was like, it's kind of odd like why are you single you're attractive you're interesting you're capable you're so passionate about what you do I just couldn't really relate to it I was like that's super weird um and I think for the industry I was in was fashion most of the guys that we were on our program dated guys so we thought well this is slim pickings <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm not really in the field to find single straight guys or, the, you know, or even if I look back then now, I don't think in, many of them were bi. So there was, it seemed like an out there problem that we were in the wrong industry. This is pre-social media. So um, there, it was tricky to meet someone outside of your network. Um, I don't know, Colette, I'm talking to Colette out there, but I don't remember if you like, you know, when you're in college or whatever, or you're working in your 20s, back then before social media, there was just, it was who you knew. You might go to, go to a party of a friend of a friend's, but for the most part, at some point, you kind of stuck on the track with the friends that you knew. So it yeah. felt like an issue of, oh, well, it's just the people I'm meeting and I'm not meeting the right people. That was before you could go online for a date. So if I fast forward, um, that was a frustration and confusion. So where's my conf frustration, confusion moment? Aaron and I moved to America and he started um, interning and then working as a practitioner at Pranskin Associates. And their fundamental chunk of their business was couples. So couples would come into town, usually as a last resort. I think people usually go for other more traditional acknowledgement, you know, methods of working with people you know for their relationships and when everything else hadn't worked they'd come or they'd come because they'd heard oh I don't know really what it's about but it seems to work go go see these people and I wasn't a practitioner I was doing design and branding and things and so here's my judgment moment I remember noticing a couple that came into town it was a tiny town of 800 people and they looked like kind of out of towners they were very smart and fancy looking Cause to me i'd got quite country bumpkin by then so meaning i was probably wearing sweats and you know very casual lifestyle and they all had like smooth hair and you know ironed clothes you know they, you could you know the out of towners are in town but i remember seeing this couple around town and they just looked you know when someone's teeth are gritted and their jaws going and it just looked like that i was like whatever's going on there that looks really unfun <laughs> they looked and then i could see they were struggling they looked very tight um it was really interesting i saw them about two or three days later and i think it was in a bakery it was the same couple and they were different 
they were different. They were soft. I hadn't spoken to the couple. I'd just seen them around. And I find out later that they'd been working at the practice that Aaron was working at. And they were technically still ironed, fancy clothes, lots of charcoal, smooth hair. But the feeling of them was totally different. Like it was soft and it was light and they, they felt like their whole, everything had softened. And it's funny to observe this from the outside. And because I'd have been observing Aaron's work, because I would sit in on groups and things, I knew that they got great results in four days. But to see it from the outside without knowing anything about what the approach was or what was happening, I was like, wow, they look different. And then I remember thinking, they must have suffered for a while. And then I remember thinking, God, why didn't they get help earlier? Was this, and then I was like, someone should have helped them earlier, you idiots out there. Why didn't someone help them earlier? Like, in, in, in a way, if you can get help in four days and you've been unhappy for maybe six years or whatever, that seemed cruel to go through that suffering when something would happen in such a short amount of time. And so I remember thinking, God, people should help, you know, like married couples or couples, like right when they first get together. Does that make sense? Um, and I kind of thought that that would be someone else's job because I was absolutely not interested in this field at all. Um, I was kind of, it's kind of like, wow, somebody should invent that kind of thought. Fast forward, oh gosh, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 or 15, I ended up getting very, very interested in this work. And starting, when I moved back though to London, I was, very, I was still connected to a lot of my friends that were now up and running and doing really well in their careers. So they were off, had boutiques or they were accessory designers or, um, and some of them had settled down, but some of them I could tell were still trying at dating. And what I started to observe, because I kind of had started to notice, I knew that there was something to do with the mind and that something was up for grabs. It wasn't just a set thing. I, noted, I started to look with a different set of eyes at the, my friends who were going on dates. And what I realized was, is when I was with them and we were having fun, they were very, very, a very natural version of themselves that had, in a way, um, they were just at ease and they were just themselves and nothing else. They didn't have to impress anyone. They didn't have to look good. But as a result, I got to see the essence of them. And that's what I loved about my friends. And you know, there was nothing in the way. And that's kind of what I would say was, you know, the unfiltered version of you, if you like. But then when they would kind of talk about their life and their jobs and everything, when they came to the world of dating, they would kind of stiffen up and get really intense and then they'd kind of get cloudy and then they would get kind of a bit disturbed and now wait on this. And then they would get kind of tense and guarded. And I would ask, well, you know, how did that one go? Like, oh, no, 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 I can't, I can't date anyone like that. I dated someone in that field before and that really didn't work out. I got really hurt or that person, really, you know, so they, I could see that they were basing their historical experience and getting less and less themselves. So they were showing up, by the time they were showing actually up on a date, they were kind of like armadillo. <laughs> it's like they're showing up on a date like an armadillo, but wanting a deep connection. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it was just like, I remember thinking, God, you really that that you, that doesn't feel like who you are when you're just yourself with me. I could see that there was something happening in their mind that was getting in the way of them just showing up as themselves. Um, and I remember thinking, huh, well, if that, that couple got help in four days, then maybe we go further back than just when you first get married. What if you help people before they even got into a relationship? before they started dating so that they're even showing up on dates in a way that's much more true to them so they don't have to pretend to be anything other than just themselves and that they don't need to be guarded so i started doing kind of um 
a bit of intake and researching people who were dating and finding out what, what, what they found hard, what were their patterns, what were they frightened of. And I think a lot of people were frightened of getting hurt again. They're very worried about having patterns, but at the same time, very frightened of getting hurt. They were very frightened of getting disappointed or embarrassed, you know, um, and worried about making the same mistakes. So they would be showing up very, very speedy and anxious. And now what tends to not occur to people going out on dates is that most people are showing up that way. So they're showing up nervous and anxious. So what they're seeing is kind of disturbed by the fact that they're already disturbed as soon as they sit down. And if someone does one thing wrong, like, oh yeah, I couldn't stand it. He ate a funny way or he put, didn't pick up my bag or like the slightest thing, it was on a point system. Then, and, and not because they're bad people, but they're on tender hooks, kind of like waiting for something to go wrong. The, the other people that are coming on dates are generally nervous too. So the version they're getting of their date is someone who's anxious and worried as well. So they're essentially a weirdo also. So the way I talk about it, it's a bit like people are showing up in Halloween gear. You know, like I'm a scary pumpkin and I'm a werewolf because they're super weird versions of themselves. If you ask anyone you know and ask them to talk about a situation where they're uncomfortable, they'll go, oh, yeah, it's really hard. And, uh, and they will actually distort themselves. <laughs> but no one thinks, oh, the guy or the woman that I'm dating might also be nervous and a weird version of themselves. Like I... I've almost never heard anyone think, God, I just think he was nervous or maybe that's not who he was. They go, oh, weirdo. And they just want to find a way to get out of the date. Um, and so I, um, I really wanted to work with people so that they could just be a natural version of themselves when showing up. Because what I have found to be true and I suspected is that when people have a quiet, clear mind, they're really smart and they're very intuitive. And finding a connection never fits within logic. It just stirs you. Connection just stirs you for no good reason. So a lot of the people I've found that kind of work with me will find that they will be, and a lot of people it's online dating. Um, it's not always, but a lot of the time they will just be looking and at some point something will just, move them in the way someone has written something often the picture's rubbish they'll go i don't know there was something about something in what he said or she said oh god the picture was really weird <laughs> i don't know if anyone said oh the picture was gorgeous but they kind of have learned to trust their mind when it's quieter and less worried and then they will find that they just sort of follow their instinct for what sort of resonates with them rather than what ticks all the boxes for making sure they don't ever get hurt again or never date a loser again you know and so as a result what starts to happen and i didn't know there was a very raw inspiration to do this all i wanted to do was to get things out of the way so people could show up with their hearts and the spirit of them rather than their worries and let people see and feel who they are in a truer sense rather than get a very disturbed, distorted version of them, which is not who they are. And I've found, which I think is really, really entertaining. So a ton of results came out of people showing up in that way. And one of them would be, God, I, I just, something made sense to me about it. Something called to me in either the way he wrote or the message he sent back. I don't know why people are using mystified as to why that resonated. There's never some logical reason. Oh, he's my type. They just say, I don't know. And they will often say, I never would have picked them. That's like hugely across the board. The people will say, I just never would have picked them. So interestingly, when people show up and they're much more naturally themselves, they're, their picker is very intuitive and they kind of go very much out of their normal. And it's shocking because they're looking outside of their tick boxes because they're not doing it logically, they're doing it intuitively. And 
what I'm finding is I had a lovely, I had a woman once say, she said, I didn't know something like, I just didn't know just me would be good enough. Um, I, I, I quite often get the, the feedback that people, when they start dating this way, will say, their partner will say, I have never met anyone like you. And that's true. And it's not true. What's true about that is there really are people in their essence have their own unique feel. But what's not, you know, like what's deceptive about that is the connection people feel is that most people are so guarded so that they're getting an unfair read on most people. So when you get someone who is literally just them, that's refreshing and is, stands out to people. Um, and I feel like working with, as far as I got with the inspiration, the people who have done the program then become my teacher. <clears throat> Is at that point that I just get to sit back and go, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, wow, that makes sense. And I get to learn from the way that the sort of women and men that run the program start to live their life. And it's interesting because I think the majority of people who have fallen into very what would be the word connected loving relationships i've seen symptoms to that is that there tends to be that the people going have who have this level of kind of understanding about themselves are very confident in their own voice in a way that they don't tend to get frustrated that they're not heard they are absolutely as far as i can see don't get bullied. Do you know what I mean? Like some people worry when they get into a relationship that they get smothered over or their voice gets knocked or they don't know who they are within it and who am I and, and they get lost in it. And I just don't see that happen. I see these incredible people that are very deeply themselves and very soft and uncompromising if it just doesn't feel right. So if one, one person in the partner wants, is pushing for something, it doesn't feel right, it's not a problem to stand up for themselves because it very, they really trust themselves. I would say that applying this understanding to dating allows you to trust yourself in, without any of the angst. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? You like kind of land in a place that it doesn't feel difficult to know what to listen to. Um, Colette, would you add anything to that that I've missed? No, I think that, um, you know, I think everything you say is just totally resonating with, with, with me. You know, I came on your Relationship Ready course two years ago and I wasn't dating. I, I had met somebody who's actually, he's on this call. <laughs> I can see he's on this call. Um, and my experience, I think, of the relationships I've had before and the relationship I've now had um, with Stuart is it's just completely, completely different. But, and I think that, that actually, you know, just being yourself is just such a lovely way to connect with somebody else. Not only for you, for them, but for them, allowing them to be themselves as well. If that makes sense. And that doesn't mean it's all rosy and all lovely all the time. That's not what I really mean. But there's a lot more. I, I feel like I've got a lot more goodwill in, in my relationship with Stuart than I've ever had with um, anyone before. And, and it looks like there's, there's not a huge amount of efforting. No, there's, there's really not a huge amount of efforting, actually, at all. So I would say effortless. Um, I actually can't believe it, and you know we're we're you know we're way down the road now, and and it just feels it feels like it gets better and better. It's not. It's you know sometimes you need in a relationship, and it gets to it's like people say, oh, the honeymoon's going to be over, kind of idea. And I think that um, actually I would say that it it just it gets more. We I feel more connected the longer we go on, not less connected. Mm. So, but there's definitely not effort in that at all. 
other than obviously when I'm grumpy or hungry or you know some of those things and I have to sort of like take myself off for a little uh, moment <laughs> yeah lovely and it's um it's lovely because you you can feel that you're both still very your own people it's not mm. like you molded into sort of some morphed version of each other and finish each other's sentences you know it's like you're both very much each other yeah and I think that that when you were saying actually when you were saying those things about um how people you know staying staying yourself and, and being your own person and and I think about the you know the significant relationships I've had in my past and definitely got lost in those for sure trying to please or trying to be or any of those things and it's such a relief not to have to do that mm. and, and one of the things that I think is really lovely about people allowing themselves just to be themselves is that you're not supposed to be just like a, a well-made bed or vanilla or pleasant or like just digestible or acceptable like you're allowed to have all of the feelings and emotions of just being human mm. but you don't get lost in the story of having them so you come back to presence because I think, you know, people always come in on the program with just a ton of stories that they don't even know they're making up. Like, oh, I'm supposed to look different or da 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 or I'm supposed to, there's something supposed to happen before I'm ready. Or I'm, do you know what I mean? And we just make up these, these, um, these steps that we think, we like, and we don't know we've made them up, don't you think? Oh, well, I, as you know, Leela, I'd made up some hugely um cast iron stories about my undateableness and uh and you just kind of blew it all apart on that first morning and i was just like oh oh yeah okay yeah yeah <laughs> and i didn't really quite know what to do with that yeah but i had and you know to me it, it felt completely logical you know i wasn't you know i wasn't the right age i wasn't the right size uh, you know i was you know, a successful businesswoman and that, like people didn't want to date people like that. And I'd got all these amazing stories about myself and you just, yeah, you just blew it up on the first morning. Like a little dynamite. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really lovely. And what's really, what's really nice, I didn't know, one of the things I didn't know, because I didn't, I've kind of learned to not assume because that doesn't do really well with learning or being present getting into stories i didn't i i could start to see that people got into relationships much more naturally and intuitively when they had a lot less on their mind i honestly didn't know what was going to happen about staying in them i didn't know whether this 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 bit of understanding pointed specifically in this way was going to be how that was going to sustain things for people and it's been really interesting because I feel like it's been incredibly sustainable to stay in them you know without then having to fix something like you're not getting in there like moving into a house and then getting bored of the bathroom and having to rip it out it's like <laughs> people seem to get just more richer and more contented which is like, whoa, that's cool. I didn't know that would happen, you know? And um, it seems to be a, a, a beautiful thing for people to consider that, I mean, I've, I kind of, my way of saying it is the natural version of you is the upgrade, always, always. So one of the things I thought I would talk about, I don't know, I mean, obviously I don't I interviewed anyone who's on the call, but one of the things I wanted to kind of go through was um, this program, a lot of the essence of this program was um, hindsight, you know, it was to try and put some hindsight 2020 in, you know, um, and I wanted to help people before they went through suffering. But if there's people who were on the call that happened to be in relationships, I wanted to sort of share a little bit of stories about um, essentially B 
being in a long-term relationship and then shifting from marriedness to dating again. Um, Claire, I don't know if you want to mute or not, if that affects, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, so one of the things that I was learning alongside kind of trying this out, trial and error, and seeing what was true, kind of given on a hunch, is that I started to look to my own mind. And actually, uh, Bonnie, when you introduced me, I feel like I should add to my client list myself. I know that sounds super cheesy. <laughs> I'm definitely my own client in the sense that I'm always really looking to see what I'm when things get hard or a bit sticky or stale, actually that's a really big deal is to start to see what I'm doing on automatic that doesn't have a, um, a feeling of freshness about it is I want to see or what happens if I let go of my thoughts about or assumptions to see what it gets replaced with. And, and, and obviously one of the things you kind of learn about when you learn the principles is to learn more about what listening means and how does that impact your life? So I wanted to share a really cute story about um, I'd started working in the principles. I think I'd been working a couple of years and I was on faculty for one of these big trainings that we're doing. And Aaron was at the front of the room with somebody teaching and I was on the faculty in the back and I was listening to him talk. And I don't know if anyone you can relate to this, that if you're either dating or you've got a partner and they're talking and they're talking and you're like, hmm quite like the way they said that I'm not sure if I agree with that oh we should have picked a different shirt am I going to cook for dinner anyway that's cool I think he could have said that a bit different <laughs> oh yeah I've heard this story before but I, I wish he'd mentioned do, do you know what I mean like you can be I call it I call it my girlfriend thing but really I'm I was looking at Aaron like I don't know if this sounds really unpolitically incorrect but like he was mine how do I feel about my thing? You know, it's like, oh, how do I feel about, as if everything he said was a, do I like how that reflects on me? And it, not in like as obvious as that, but I'm sitting there thinking of him as an extension of me in a really weird way. And I remember sitting there going, oh, well, I'm not disagreeing with what he's saying, but I realized it had a sort of like, I might as well have been watching EastEnders or telly. It's like, I'm ch oh, I can't believe he said that. She did like, you know, it's like, and as, although a lot of what he was saying, I thought, oh, that's cool. Oh, he's doing a good job. Oh, he missed the point. You know, like, it's so funny that I'm doing this. And I'm think, and then it occurs to me, because I see the feeling of my listening. I'm like, <laughs> you're not listening, are you, Leela? <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's like Aaron. I'm like, no, 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 Leela, you're not listening. Like, your job is to show up and your job is to listen. And it doesn't matter whether it's Aaron. And I kind of saw my role way back then that I was there to help and support him and encourage him. And I was quite junior in the company, but I was like, yeah, but Leela, you're not listening. So I decided to see what it would look like if I dropped my listening and my girlfriend thinking. Um, and so I kind of let go of all this thinking. And as I'm letting go, honestly, I feel like somebody I feel like I was like trying to watch telly through a shower curtain or try and look at a sunset through like a misty shower curtain. It's like, and when I started actually listening, it's like I just got hit by the raw feed of a proper sunset in the sense that it was, actually, that's a terrible analogy. I scrapped that. It was like I went from just seeing him through sort of very cheerful analysis to suddenly having this absolute stranger in front of me. Like, I think my mouth opened. I think my mouth actually opened. I think I was like, <laughs> it's like, that's, di uh, that's a different experience of Aaron. Like, that's not even a shade of what I was seeing a minute ago when I was doing my girlfriend thinking. He was literally brand new. It was like having a cold shower, actually. It was like a big, it was just, I was just like, and he's talking and it's like I've never heard him speak before and he's not mine anymore. He's this person that's got, that's individual in the world but has his own voice. And because I'm not assessing what he's saying, I'm starting to hear what he's saying. 
as if a stranger was talking to me, as if I've never heard it before. And I was like, I was super gobsmacked because I had no idea the effect of couples thinking has. Do you know what I mean? I was just like, okay, if I'd have guessed, I would have thought I would have just got a little bit clearer and that would have been maybe even got a bit richer. Small. I didn't expect it to be a 360 and I was literally a bit, I don't know if I was embarrassed, but I was a little bit chagrined at how much, how many years I've spent listening to him or viewing him as something that's all about how do I feel about it. And I realized when I first started dating Aaron, the first thought I had was, oh, I quite like him. And then it was, does he like me? I mean, it, the, you know, the, 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 the dialogue started from word go and then we became a couple and then it's, do I like the way he does that? Oh, I love the way he does, you know, and it's just like, I had never really taken him for the pure human that he was in the world outside of my relationship and significance. And it was very humbling and quite beautiful and shocking. It was shocking. So what was interesting over the next few months in terms of being in a couple is I started to notice how much unlistening I did and how kind of everything was really subtly, I don't, wouldn't say I was tit for tat because it was nicer than that, but it was, it, none of it was just fresh in the moment for no good reason. And so what started to happen was because I was looking at my listening around him as not being that way something happened and that was that an innocence started to flood my feeling around him when i wasn't doing that i started to fill up with a lot of goodwill and innocence so if he make a mistake instead of being like oh he always does that i'd be like oh look that's okay like i would be like I would roll with it in the moment and see what would make sense. Or if he did something really sweet, I would be like, oh, that's, that's really lovely you did that. Like I'd really see it for just the purity of what was happening in the moment. And I realized I didn't have this innocence when we started dating when I was 21. I didn't know that you could do that. This is 18 years in. I had no idea there had never been innocence. I mean, I really, when we got together, we were sort of magnetic together. Like it was just, it wasn't even a question really once we became a couple. But I had no idea that I had so much guard up because I had been raised to think you have to make sure people don't railroad you and take advantage. You gotta be strong feminist. You gotta look after yourself. You don't wanna, you know, I just, so I was always on the lookout for not getting taken advantage of. And if anyone made a mistake that that meant there was a pattern or whatever, um, I'm making myself out to be a total head case, but I do think that that's possibly, I don't know, people can say like not uncommon. But what was striking to me is how much innocence I had in the moment didn't mean I was kind of like an uh, angel or anything, but the feeling in the house became that there was this beautiful elasticity that it, things didn't all have significance anymore. It was like, as opposed to trying to move in, in gravy or something really thick, it's like we were actually in water together. It was really beautiful. And I, I just didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know I was doing that. Um, and so, having kind of worked with people in this way when people are getting stuck like in their job i'm like oh you need to date your job <laughs> you should date your job you know like in the meaning like oh you should date your husband like you meaning what if you showed up just as you like literally just as you what if you didn't need to homogenize or be a certain way and you were at ease in yourself and you weren't running stories so one of the things that came up for um a current group was it just got really tangible as a way of talking about it. You can either be in a story or you can be in a moment. That's kind of it. If you want to simplify it, you can be in the moment or in a story. 
And stories don't make you safe. They like make you less smart. Um, and um, that's been a really, really lovely thing. I'm just, I just get to the point of tears quite a lot when I hear people connecting directly with their heart in the world and feeling a love they've always wanted. And it makes me very, very emotional and so grateful that, that, that I get to witness that in people because I'm just time and time again, I get the in love, I get an in love experience of seeing people be able to share the deepest part of themselves without thinking it needs to be anything other than just that. I'm just wondering whether it might be a nice time for questions. I don't know if people have any. Does anybody have any questions? Or no? You don't have to. If you do, you can unmute yourself or feel free to raise your hand and I, I can unmute you. There we go. Hi, Lila. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Because my bandwidth is rather low today. Yeah, you're so loud. I jumped. Did you see me? I was like a, like a little hedgehog there. I, was like, I nearly <laughs> fell off my stool. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to blast you. Uh, in fact, I had Bonnie on the screen, so I didn't see you jump. <laughs> but the, um, I thought I'd raise my hand because when I came to the principles just over a year ago, I was absolutely in my story at the end of a 30 year relationship. And my stories around that was that if I stayed in the relationship, I would experience spiritual death, that I was not free to be myself. Oh, the stories, the stories, the habit, the habit, the habit. And of course, once I began to explore this understanding, all that began to shift and I make new discoveries every day, but there is a but, and that is that the habitual, the habit of me and the habit of the me thinking about the relationship is very slow to release. And I really loved uh, what you said about you can either be in a story or in the moment because the problem I think for those of us with really long-term quote unquote dysfunctional relationships is that we have lived in the story for so long, we don't even know we're in the story. It, it's just happening. So it's been really interesting to watch myself experience not only a change of my experience of the relationship with my partner, but by extension, a change in the relationship between me and my thoughts, because that really, that is the first relationship that has to shift to where I'm no longer believing the story. I'm not articulating this at all well. I'm just saying that things are constantly and slowly shifting, but at least until now, it has not been a rapid process. I do know that within this understanding, one can have huge breakthroughs where everything changes in a heartbeat, just sort of like the experience you had watching Aaron and when you realized what your thinking was doing. But I'm not getting as clear a vision of my thinking because of the long standing habits. Anyway, it's not really a question. It was just since you did ask if anyone had experience of this in the context of long-term relationships. This is what I'm currently living. And I don't know where it leads. I don't know whether ultimately we stay together or whether ultimately we separate. But the whole story that I had around it is gradually melting. No, it's lovely. It's it's I think it's really interesting, you know, a lot of I do this program when I'm finding between 50 and 70 people are very immersed and trained in the principles. So it's not like they haven't come across the principles. It's just that for some reason, the penny hasn't totally dropped in that department yet, which is why I'm, which is, you know, I didn't know what would happen with that. And it's really interesting. So I'm listening to you and I'm thinking two things occurred to me, not that you asked a question, but I don't know if you, if these resonate with you, I did actually get really unhappy at one point. Um, I've shared this at other conferences, but um, 
I was really unhappy for a really long time. And I was living with should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't understand because I'd started learning the principles. I understood that thoughts transient, except every time I looked at the feeling between Aaron and I, it was muddy. It wasn't bad. I didn't hate him. I just didn't enjoy him. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that because I'm like, well, where's the principles now? You know, I don't, I just didn't want to do, and I, I, I would switch between thinking, well, the principles must apply here. And, and then also thinking, well, should I just go moan to my friends that will just say, girl, get a divorce. And that's terrible that he's messy or whatever. Like the conventional, oh, you're just denying it. It's dead in the water. And I was thinking, is it dead in the water? Is it dead in the water? I don't know. Cause every time, like it was a long time that it was just no feeling. Cause it wasn't even like passion upset. It was just, it was and we ended up walking in the woods one day and I was so felt so like I'd betrayed him so deeply because I didn't feel like I loved him in the same way I was really burdened I mean I just felt horrible I felt so bad that I didn't even tell my friends because I felt like that would be a betrayal without talking to him first but I couldn't talk to him because I was so worried about hurting him And so he knew I was unhappy and he broke the subject and I was like, oh, I was like an animal that just got caught at like, I don't know, eating the cake or something. I don't know, not quite that, but I I just was like, oh shit, he's talking to me about it. And he said, look, I know you're unhappy. And there was no lying. I said, no, I'm not. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I just don't feel the same way. And um, he said, I really love you and I want to be with you, but I want you to be happy more than that. I'd rather you were happy somewhere else if that's what you wanted. And we're walking and it was such a relief to have it out in the open that my whole head started to relax. My shoulders relaxed. It didn't feel as scary to talk about it in the moment. What happened was, is my head freed up. And for the first time in a really long time, I wasn't doing should I, should I, should I, should I. You know, like bomb disposal people. <laughs> red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. You know, like usually when we're trying to choose between red, blue, red, blue, we're choosing between two sucky options anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right? And the weirdest thing happened now, I'm walking along and as my head clears and my spirits rise for first, and I, all the guilt lifts. Oh my God felt so guilty for not feeling more loving because he's such a good man and he's so patient and loving to me. And I just, and everything lifted and I got light and it was, and we started talking it through. Like we were talking about, oh, what would that look like? And as I'm walking, the funniest thing happened. It was so funny. And I'm going to take, give you a visual on this because I think it's hilarious. I used to love Barbie dolls because they came in those plastic containers with like their beach kit. You know, I know we couldn't think of the plastic the same way anymore, but I love that she had like a bucket and spade for her evening gear. And, mm-hmm. and Aaron's always had like a super cuteness to me. Like I just, he's so he's lovely. And um, I had this really weird thought come out of the blue because there was a lot of room in my head for the first time in a super long time. And it said, if Aaron was like a Ken Barbie, like he was like, a little set, like a Ken doll Barbie. And he was on a shelf of guys, like with all a bunch of guys. And I think I put Brad Pitt next to him. <laughs> like I really like Brad Pitt, especially when he's eating. I was like, if there was just a bunch of guys on a shelf and I was picking again, would I pick him at all? Second, third, would I pick Brad Pitt? And if he's there out of stock, then pick. And I honestly didn't know. I think it's a bit of a weird thing to ask yourself in the middle of a divorce conversation, but whatever. Mind has a funny way of working. And, and I didn't know for a, a split second. And then, and then an answer came, like an email coming into your email, like it's as if it's not from you. And it was, yes. And I'd pick him first. Wow, that's beautiful. And it shocked me. That's the funny (laughs) thing. I was like, no, twist. Now, what was beautiful about that is I didn't know that's how I felt. 
and I didn't know that the feeling wasn't nice because I didn't, I was having invisible thoughts. I didn't, I didn't really understand. I do feel it could have been no. I do feel it could have been no. I was really open to it being anything. I just know it happened to be yes, and I would pick him first. I think I got a great deal. I'm really lucky. Like I just, and I literally couldn't believe that was the answer, honestly. But getting a free mind around it and not living in a should I, shouldn't I, it's really hard to appreciate how that's blocking up the Wi-Fi. You know, you came on, you said my Wi-Fi is not great. Well, that blocks up, you know, like that just clogs up the reception big time. And, and as of that day, I never, when I got married, I got married and hoped that it would last, but didn't think anything would last because nobody stayed married when I was growing up or what I saw. And I don't have any thinking about how long it will last, but I'm so excited to see him at the end of the day. And we work together. <laughs> <laughs> And I know, and what's fascinating is, you know that crappy phase I just described? I could go on about it and go longer. The muddy water phase, the sort of sad, hopeless phase, whatever. Um, that feeling came back about a year ago. And I said to Aaron, because I have understanding, I said, Aaron, because I could see the way we were with it. You know what we were doing? We were banking thought. So one of us would say something that wasn't even like outrageous and the other person would be like, yeah, well, wouldn't, we wouldn't be coming at it fresh, which kind of stood out to me because that wasn't not our normal. And then I remember saying to Aaron, it was like six in the morning, we're driving home from the gym and I said, I kind of been noticing love that I think we've lost our kindness for each other. Like we lost our tenderness and it's not who's right, who's wrong. I just saw the essence of it and it was really interesting because he says god i think you're right we did no intervention nothing happened it didn't disappear in one thought like one second away it just softened over the space of the next maybe four to five weeks but what was so amazing was to not worry i didn't worry about us I, and I also know that a disturbed mind is not the mind that will give you the answer you need. It was really helpful for me. I'm kind of thrilled that that came back because it meant it came back, but I had understanding. And I have so little judgment on whether people stay together or move apart. But you, whatever you do to be connected to yourself deeply and be in a free mind and in a loving feeling, you will know. I, that's my that's that's my my take on it. Is that interesting or helpful? Extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, uh, the idea of the shall I shan't I muddying the bandwidth was not new to me because Rohini talks about this too. That as long as you're on the fence, you're it, it's creating uh, it's creating fog. It's creating fog, and you can't see you can't see truth in anything mm -hmm. but i i appreciated that you shared that that the muddiness actually came back but that you were able with clearer vision to pinpoint that that was what was happening that there there was there was a shift that you both had slipped back into a variation on probably old patterns and you were seeing that you were no longer that that's really that's the trap in relationships slipping back into the way things have been habitually and of course it happens more and now i'm just stream of consciousness talking but it happens more readily when one is stressed the slipping back i think because it's easy to be present and kind when everything's going smoothly but if everything's going to hell in a handbasket, it's a lot harder to stay present because the stories spin up pretty quickly about disaster scenarios, problems, et cetera, et cetera, and judgments, judgments, judgments. So I loved the way you presented that. Uh, I, loved, I loved the feel of it. 
and I can definitely see I can see that there's more to see in that direction and that I can look there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for contributing. I really appreciated that. Aww. You guys, it's so funny. Check this out. So I thought there were like three people on this webinar and then I clicked whole screen and went, oh my God. <laughs> There's loads of people there. That's fantastic. We have like three minutes left before we're done. T Tiffany, I noticed you just unmuted yourself. Yes, um, I just had a comment. I'm relatively new to the three principles. I, um, I kind of explored it maybe a couple years ago and found uh, the three principles honestly hopelessly confusing. And I know that's a common experience for people sometimes getting into it. And then as my extreme fortune would have it, life circumstances kind of led me back into that. But um, I think that the most important thing that you touched on to me was that was what you just recently said because I found this to be true in my experience that you know when you have that mind cluttered with thought you can't get that clarity you need on your relationship and that my pattern has been since my divorce to because I was hurt is to get in and then kind of each subsequent relationship there was a new hurt and now I'm currently in a relationship with somebody and we you know, we read the same kind of books and we have a lot in common and it's nice. But the only thing in our relationship that does damage is both of us worrying about the relationship. <laughs> I mean, we're getting along great. There's nothing wrong except we're both worried about getting hurt. So we're both triggered by each other's behaviors because our minds, you know, even though I'm studying and learning these three principles, he's not so much there yet. But uh, it's just interesting when I start to let my mind clutter up with these thought processes of, why did he do that? Why did he say that? Why did he have that dream? I mean, <laughs> what is this subconscious mind saying? You know, because <laughs> I'm, uh, um, I do anxiety therapy and hypnotherapy and stuff. So I'm psychoanalyzing our relationship and then frustrated because I have no clarity. I feel like I don't see you know, is this relationship going anywhere? Instead of just saying, I'm just going to be. And then the wisdom I need will come to me when the time is. And when we get to that place where we've had enough conversations, sometimes we'll just talk about our fears and we just let the relationship be, everything is fine. <laughs> you know, And it amazes me just how much that pain from the past produces these thought processes and we latch on to them. And if we get to that place where, you know, we're just letting those thoughts go and just living in that present moment and trusting ourselves that we're going to find the answers that we need and, and our intuition is going to guide us, you know, it's that innate mental and emotional health, which is something I taught my clients even before I came to the, the three principles was that I knew that you have without your thoughts, um, interfering innate mental and emotional health that we're born with that and um, the three principles just reinforced that and expanded on it but it's interesting how much even though I know that and I teach that I find myself <laughs> getting caught back up in that same process of obsessing about my relationships and I think like what you mentioned I think that's the pattern if we could stay away from that obsessing about our relationship um, and just be free of that thought how much better every relationship would be you know it's, it's, it's been very insightful just listening to that and having that be reinforced today for me mm, that's lovely and I think we I mean the word patterns comes up a lot but sometimes the way we talk about it gives it a grandiose like it has any power other than in the moment of being a story that you tell yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if a pattern was nothing but a story that you tell yourself and you can listen to or not, it downgrades it. So you can do story or the moment. Yeah, yeah, good point. Hmm. Lovely, oh, I'm dying to hear how, how you get on. <laughs> 
<laughs> you will be and tell me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, it's lovely to lovely to chat and for the questions we've had. I know we, we're at an hour. Um, Bonnie, is there anything else that um, we need to do before we're done? No, I think we're good unless you want to talk about your program, any programs that you have going on or starting. Yeah. Up. So, so we don't have a date for the next one, but we run uh, women and men's uh, relationship readies. Occasionally we do it in the States. Um, if people are interested, they should email me. Um, and, but mostly they're run in a really lovely part of London, in central London. Um, and they're about eight weeks long. It's a really nice... Um, it's a really nice format that gives people time to kind of be out in life and reflect on it. So the, it's, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about it on here, but if you want to hear this, should I talk about the structure briefly or no? Sure. So the essence of it is we spend two days together as a group, usually in quite an intimate group, just, you know, sitting and taking a load off and reflecting on the mind and looking at that totally afresh. So whatever your understanding is, it's beautiful because you can put your understanding aside and, and take a fresh look at the, you know, the mind and the principles in relation to relationships. And so you have a kind of retreat and it's really lovely because people are like connecting together and hearing other people's stories. That means a lot to people. Um, and everybody's kind of different, which is wonderful. And then you have about eight weeks where you're sent, actually it's longer, it's more like 12. So you have a lot of a video a week that's all commissioned around the, what I would call the potholes, but some of them are quite funny, you know, because if you do step back, we are kind of hilarious. Like if I give the example earlier of being like a Halloween outfit, you kind of see that it is quite comical how we are really not ourselves and then we're confused by that, <laughs> the results. Um, and, and then there's individual calls throughout there to see what you're learning and kind of really touch base and connect and kind of move the relevance along for you so you can really infuse this into your relationships and your dating. Um, that's kind of what I would say about it. I could go on more, but I don't want to drag there's that out. a question tonight. of whether there is an online version of this, like for the two days in person, is there a way to do that online? No, not as yet, because I haven't, um i haven't figured out how i could do that effectively like by having screens because it's so intimate like we sit together we drink tea together and um but if there was a, like a particular interest in this if it was in the states or the uk usually it's not um it's doable for people if if, if i find out where they're based um yeah so uh, maybe, um, yeah. tiffany get uh send an email to leland and uh, see if that could work out yeah yeah and also anyone who's done the program they say oh t anyone wants to talk to me i'll tell them about it and colette's one of them but we have pretty much everybody that's done the program says oh i'll talk to people if you want if they want to hear what it's like um because i think that they the people who do it are the program that they're, they're they're the life of it so that's totally on offer if you want to talk to people you know and find out their experience do you just do this in the UK? There's a question, where in the US do you usually hold it? Um, the one I held before was in Portland. I've had requests for um, more Central America and I've had requests to do it in LA. So those are the other places that people have been asking me about. It's lovely. to. Ha Thank you for having me. Thank you, Leela. This was uh, really a great conversation. I, I enjoyed it. I think everybody did. So I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you. And I'd be lovely to see if people have questions. If people contact me, if you have questions, let me know, of course. Yeah. I and want to say have a lovely weekend, but I just realized it's Monday. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, happy holidays to everyone, right? The yes. next webinar is um, not until January 8th. And that's with Marina Galan. So um, happy holidays, everyone, and see you next year and next decade, right? Yay, 2020. It's our eyesight. Maybe we will be 2020. Yeah. <laughs> 2020. 2020. All right. Thanks, Thanks you guys. So Clip. Thanks so much for coming. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.